Thanks to the City Club for having me. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, you may want to join me next month. I'll be celebrating my 28th birthday, which will be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Um, I want I I want to try to cover really a waterfront, broad waterfront of of energy issues in a in a short period of time. Uh, so I, I I'll dispense with the Washington humor. I simply leaving it that when I finally learned that it does look like Jeb Bush will be entering the race, I finally understood what the Bush administration meant by no child left behind. Um, uh, uh, but I can. Well, last week I was in California. I was talking about their great recycling program. I said, "Look at Jerry Brown." So I could, I convinced. <laughs> By the way, I'm a registered independent, and and actually, I'm going to get on this. Some of these energy issues really do get incredibly political these days. Um, what I want, if you, as you're thinking about questions, I want to quickly review the 2014 elections because that has an impact on where energy policy is going. Uh, I want to touch on where I think Congress may go on energy issues. These uncertainties. Uh, I want to touch on Keystone, I uh, want to touch on Western policy challenges, um, and the like. Uh, my company, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, we actually started 35 years ago as a geothermal company. Um, Ten geothermal plants down at the Salton Sea in California, and uh, we were purchased by Berkshire Hathaway in 2000. I'll, I'll leave you with one, a number of you are Berkshire shareholders. My, my favorite Buffett story on that is I brought him to Washington in 2000. This was before Enron, this was before the California electricity crisis, and from the White House to the Senate, meeting after meeting, he must have said it five times. He said, you know, electricity should be a good business, not a great business. And I remember thinking, you know, what the hell does he mean? I mean, you're the oracle of Omaha, you're, and, and, and then came Enron, then came the California electricity crisis and the like. And if you had to sum it all up in one sentence, it would be electricity should be a good business, not a great business. And if you try to turn it into a great business, you're either going to go to jail or you're really going to get overregulated. So Mr. Buffett was, was quite prescient. Um, 2014 midterms. Um, I don't think the results have really sunk in that much. Look at the Democrats in January of 2009, 60 seats in the U.S. Senate, now 46. Look at their loss from 2009 to 2014 in the House of Representatives, 70 seats from uh, 257 and the majority down to 188. We're now looking at the largest GOP majority in the House of Representatives since 1928. Um, now, one argue, you can certainly argue midterm turnout is very different from what it is in presidential years, um, very skewed to white voters, elderly voters, and that's very much a Republican base. Uh, we had the lowest turnout of voters since 1942. Barely one-third of eligible voters voted, and I think in 1942 we had a lot of reasons for not voting. Um, uh, presidential turnout is anywhere from 50 to 60 percent. Um, a record number of independent voters as well. But midterms are frequently seen as a referendum on the incumbent. And historically, a two-term president does pretty lousy in year six of, of his term. Uh, Eisenhower in 58, um, the Republicans lost a lot of seats. Uh, George W. in 2006 lost a lot of seats. Uh, the only president, uh, only two-term president in, in the 20th century did not lose seats under, in, 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 his second, in his year six of the two-term was Bill Clinton in 98. Um, even more impressive are the Republican gains in the state legislatures. Um, uh, the Republicans went from 21 governors six years ago to 31. So that's 40% of the states to over 60% of the states. They're now, they're now Republican governors in Illinois and in my home state of Maryland. I mean, a, a Democratic bastion uh, with Republican governors. Um, there are 99 legislative bodies, Nebraska is unicameral, but every other state has a House and Senate or an Assembly or something like that. Republicans now control 68 of those 99, the highest they've ever controlled. Um, and they've got governorships. When you look at states where Republicans control both houses of the legislature and the governorship, that's 23 states. Democrats control seven. So a lot of, a lot of big changes. In the Senate, what's interesting to me is the 13 new senators join 33 others who together are serving less than one term. So we've got 46 kind of rookies, if you will, 
um, in the Senate. And right now, um, if you really, if you took a map of the United States and you looked at House of Representatives, 14% of the land area of the United States has Democrats. 86 is Republican because Democratic votes are really concentrated in urban areas uh, and, and in minorities and kind of narrow bands largely um, uh, on, on the two coasts. Um, but we as voters have also been voting consistently for divided government. So go back to 1992, so that's A plus 15, go back the last 23 years, the last 24 years. Democrats have held the White House for 16 of those 24 years, so two thirds. Republicans have held, the, have held the House for 18 of those 24, and each party has had the Senate for 12. Um, so we're, we're not big on unified control, and that's one of the problems we face as we look at these challenges. So let me move on to specific challenges, and I want to focus mostly on the electricity side of energy, but I do want to talk about Keystone um, and, uh, and get to the transportation side. Single biggest challenge facing the, the electricity industry today uh, are environmental standards. Uh, the EPA, uh, a whole series of rules, uh, and I could, I, you, you could spend an hour on each one. I mean, there's a mercury and air toxic control rule, there's new source performance standards, regional haze, there are rules for air, there are rules for climate, there are rules for water, there are rules for land and natural resources, there are avian protection, there's endangered species, there's waste and chemical management. A lot of pressure to change the resource mix of our electricity sector. Um, 60,000 megawatts of coal will be retired by 2017. 60,000 megawatts. Put that in perspective, the entire state of California now in the winter is running on about 30,000 and that's a pretty big economy. Um, we've got maybe 200,000 megawatts total. We're really looking at, at retiring over 20% of the U.S. coal fleet, and it's really just starting. Um, other disruptive changes, uh, increasing expectations for reliability. Um, we've got aging plants. Uh, the average age of a coal plant in the United States today is 42 years. Now, that will probably make it easier since that means a lot of them are fully depreciated. It may make it easier to make this transition that the industry is being forced into to some extent, um, uh, but uh, it's, it's a huge challenge. We're moving from centralized power to what's called distributed energy, uh, simply to more customer-generated power, and I'll talk a little bit more about DG or distributed generation in, in a couple minutes. It's a changing relationship from the utility to the customer. I mean, for years, the utility would supply the industry and the customer would write the check. Uh, if you've got solar rooftop, you're supplying the electricity and the utility's writing you the check. And on top of that, we've had flat load growth, flat growth for electricity. If you look from 2007 to today, zero growth in new electricity demand. And that is a huge contrast uh, from the past. In the 50s, through the decade of the 1950s, the electricity sector expanded 10%, 9.5% annual growth. 7% annual growth in the 60s, about 5% in the 70s. So there was this incremental growth, even growing at 3%. That's not bad if you're a large utility and, you, and, 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 and you're adjusting to changes. Flat to zero load growth is pretty tough if you're being forced to change out your power plants and make a lot of other changes. Um, why the flat load growth? Obviously, we're, we're still slow coming out from the recession. Uh, this distributed generation where um, utilities are not generating all of the electricity used, and I think big increases on energy efficiency. Um, other uncertainties. There's no price on carbon in this country, but every single utility is acting like there's a price on carbon. I don't know a single utility that's planning a new coal plant. Some are finishing up, but no one's got new coal plants on the drawing boards. Uh, renewable energy, nuclear energy, certainly need a price on carbon uh, or some sort of penalty on carbon if they're going to grow. Um, big, big challenges on integrating these variable resources into the grid of wind and solar. Um, so we've got the minimal growth, but we've got these mandates coming either from the EPA, um, need to do the new transmission that goes with the new renewables, so it's really very difficult. Where will the growth be? 
I think the economy will come back somewhat. I think there may be some growth in the area of electric vehicles, maybe in energy storage. But let me run through each of the, of the, of the energy sources. Um, how do you generate electricity? What are the sources? Hydro. Hyd well, renewable. Hydro, geothermal, wind, solar, that's one. Nuclear. Nuclear. Fossil, mining. Fossil, what kind of fossil? Mining. Coal. Natural. Natural. Natural gas. Natural gas. So those are really the big four. Nuclear, well, coal, nuclear, natural gas, renewables generally. I would add a fifth. I'd call it energy efficiency, sort of a megawatt as opposed to a megawatt. But let me, let me run through those. Let's start with nuclear. Positive side, huge amount of carbon-free electricity, growing public acceptance. Um, even in the Obama, I mean, in a Democratic administration, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission giving the green light for new nuclear plants. Um, uh, unlike other countries post-Fukushima, we did not shut down. I mean, um, you know, Germany has, has said they're shutting down their 23 nuclear reactors post-Fukushima. I'm not aware that that's a big problem in Bavaria. Switzerland, in its wisdom, is shutting down its five nuclear plants. I think Swiss, Switzerland, as far as I know, has been tsunami-free for at least my lifetime. Um, um, but we're not. But it is the, the industry, well, I'm, I'm young. Um, the, the, um, but the industry is stagnant. Uh, it's stagnant. Uh, the, the real reason today is nuclear is simply not cost competitive. If you remember anything from this lunch, the biggest change in electricity in the last 40 years is fracking and natural gas. And the huge, I mean the gigantic supply we're seeing in natural gas and that same technology being applied to oil. Nuclear is just not competitive. There are still these public fears that a nuclear power plant is sort of an atomic bomb attached to a, you know, a distribution line or something like that. And we've got the nuclear st storage problem. Uh, coal is a big challenge. Uh, down from 50% of our electricity mix to below 40%. The Environmental Protection Agency has rules now that any new coal plant must have carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, we're pretty good at, um, at capturing carbon and we're pretty good at, uh, uh, at monitoring it, but uh, we're not good at piping it and carbon capture is simply not commercially available. Natural gas, everybody seems to love natural gas. It's the bridge fuel, half as much emissions, greenhouse gas emissions as coal. Um, a lot of flexibility, you can run a peaker plant, so if you're trying to integrate wind and solar, a natural gas plant can work a lot more easily than coal or nuclear, which it's baseload, those are 24-7, you can't turn a coal plant on and off. If you've got a gas stove, you can turn that gas on and off in a second. Some peaker plants, natural gas plants, can really work almost that quickly. But again, a lot of challenges. Um, my own company, we're, we're going to be fuel switching from coal to natural gas on a number of plants. That can be pretty hard to do. Um, you run a coal plant, you can look out the window and look at your fuel supply for 30 days. You run a natural gas plant, uh, that's just-in-time delivery, and you're hoping that the hospital down the road and all the houses in your neighborhood are not going to call on that. So a lot of challenges with natural gas. Renewables, um, three big drivers for renewable energy. There have been tax policy, there have been state renewable portfolio standards or mandates uh, California had one at 20 percent, up to 33 percent now by 2020, and Governor Brown announced last month that he wants California to, to be at 50 percent renewables by 2030. So these, these mandates or, or sticks, if you will, there are carrots um, in terms of tax incentives, and then there's kind of these indirect drivers from the, from the EPA that are simply making coal um, uh, less economic. The problem with the tax incentives um, is that uh, the one for wind uh, went away at the end of 2014, called a production tax credit. The one for solar probably will die at the end of 2016. A lot of uncertainties. This concept of, of distributed generation, don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but as opposed to a centralized power plant, you think of rooftop solar. Think of energy created near the source uh, that still taps into the grid. Um, and customers can use net meter and can actually sell their electricity to the utility when they are over generating. But again, you know, customers want choice um, and utilities are going to have to adjust to that, uh, but, but there's still a need to keep rates reasonable um, and to keep everything fair. Generally, we've seen, for example, mostly in California but other states, the more affluent of us can afford those rooftop solar arrays um, and, and finance them. 
Um, so this has got to be thought through carefully. And then there's just all this uncertainty on climate change in general. Um, I mean, I'd say climate change has kind of joined, you know, abortion and gay marriage. It's, it's kind of like a cultural issue. We're not even talking about the science. Um, it's, it's become part of this national debate about the role of government. So again, we've got conservatives saying that liberals are using climate change to undermine the sovereignty of states and to support great, greater federal regulation. And liberals are saying that conservatives are just kind of deniers um, and, and are trying to protect fossil interests. And that's, um, that's, about where, that, that's about the extent of the debate in Washington, I'm afraid. Um, the new Congress, uh, well, the old Congress had a pretty lousy track record. Um, 296 bills passed by the last Congress. Uh, the lowest since they've been keeping records. Some of those were, you know, to name bridges and post offices and the like. Um, and what was amazing is each house passed hundreds of bills that the other house never even took up. Um, now, some would say that's great. I mean, you know, don't, the, the less the lunatics are running the asylum, that's better. Um, but, I mean, you know, we, we, the, the, our highway trust fund is running out of money in May. The, the Department of Homeland Security is running out of money in five days. Uh, tax reform is, was, was H.R. 1. That was the number one issue. We haven't seen that. Um, to me, I think uh, the crying shame is one quarter of our embassies around the world do not have ambassadors because we can't even get nominations through. Um, so not a great state of affairs. A lot of infighting among Republicans. There's the little bit of this Tea Party legacy. Um, and right now, the Republicans are facing this challenge on Capitol Hill. It's one thing to throw grenades from the back bench. It's another thing to govern, and that's going to be their big challenge. Um, Democrats doing their share of fighting. Uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, number three in the Senate, gave a talk last month, um, a real political gaffe. A political gaffe is defined as telling the truth. Um, <laughs> he gave a talk. He's, he, he said... Um, uh, that, that Democrats should not have focused on Obamacare first, that there were other issues for middle-class America. One could argue that either way. Um, Senator Reid, the, the ex-majority leader, his chief of staff, publicly criticized President Obama. Uh, six Democrats voted against Reid in this new Congress to be the minority leader. Um, last November, when there finally was an appropriations bill, Congress didn't even pass an appropriations bill. There, there are 13 different appropriations bill, and the, the houses can't even do that. It's one big omnibus bill at the end of the year, which is called really a continuing resolution. I think the State Department has not had a separate appropriations bill in 14 years. It's just been one continuing resolution after another. Nancy Pelosi opposed it. President Obama said vote for it. So it's kind of ironic. You would think the Democrats would be enjoying the Tea Party and the, the, the internecine fighting among the Republicans, but the Democrats are doing a pretty good job on their own. Uh, the president tacking somewhat to the left after the elections. Um, people say he's kind of ignoring the election results. Um, uh, one can argue that one way or the other. I do think that there's about a six-month window for the president and the, and the new Republican leadership to work together on Capitol Hill. And I think it can happen. I mean, I think there can be approval on issues I don't want to get into of, of trade, uh, infrastructure, maybe tax reform, uh, but they're going to run out. So that, 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 that window is going to, going to close pretty soon as we get into 2016 politics. Energy issues. What are the Republicans looking at? Generally, they'll throw it. It's a little bit like when you talk about tax reform. Want to lower the tax base? Want to, want to lower rates and broaden the base? Well, who doesn't want to do that? Then you get into the details. Well, the Republicans talk about grid stability and resiliency and affordability and streamlining. Everybody wants to streamline permitting. Nobody's opposed to that. Specifically, um, the EPA is going to go after uh, a rule. I'm going to talk about it briefly. It's called Rule 111D. It's a rule promulgated by the Environmental Protection Agency um, that will become final in June uh, or sometime this summer. Um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants. Now, you think about that. It's one thing to say, if you want to build a new power plant, here are the restrictions. But this rule will affect existing coal plants. Uh, there will certainly be an attempt to, to attack that. We will see legislation for streamlining um, regulations. There will be a debate on, on uh, exporting uh, crude oil. Um, there will be a debate on exporting liquefied natural gas. Um, you know, it's funny, we don't have debates on exporting John Deere tractors or exporting Boeing jets. I mean, that's great. 
I mean, that's great for the trade deficit. But we do have debates on both natural gas and oil, and, and those even di differentiate uh, in the sense that if you're a politician, you want to be really careful about saying we should export crude oil because when gasoline prices go up again, you're going to get blamed. Uh, so we could, or and then you can also make your geopolitical arguments that if we could export our natural gas, we could really help out Western Europe vis-a-vis -vis its reliance on, on, on Russia. Um, there will be attempts to legislate on grid security. There'll probably be um, uh, legislation to restart Yucca Mountain uh, for spent nuclear fuel. Um, but the real question is where will, where will the president go on this? Will there be enough votes, the 60 votes needed, to uh, invoke cloture in the U.S. Senate to move a bill along? But more importantly, with the president having already said there are about 12 or 13 bills he would veto, where's the two-thirds needed to override a presidential veto? That's 67 votes in the Senate, and if you do your math, it's 290 in the House. I don't know if, I don't know if we're going to get there. Let's take Keystone as an example. Keystone pipeline, you all know about it, I assume, Trans-Canada building it, moving oil sands down to Gulf of Mexico. We've got about a million and a half miles of oil pipelines in this country. This is like less than 1% of our pipelines, but obviously it became the, the, it was everybody to the barricades. It passed the Senate with 62 votes. Um, if uh, Marco Rubio had been there, it would have gotten 63 votes. The House passed it with 270 votes. That included 29 Democrats. But remember, 63 votes, you need 67 to override a veto because the President has said he will veto it. Uh, 270, you've got to come up with 20 more votes in the House. Um, now, the Republicans may, they're going to send it, it's already on the President's desk as a standalone measure. He'll probably veto it. Uh, the Republicans may bring it back as part of something the President really needs or has to sign, like a spending bill. Uh, we'll see. Um, you know, five years ago, the environmental community said, we got to keep this, they call it tar sands, the Canadians call it oil sands, it's heavy oil. Got to keep these tar sands in the ground. Keep it in the ground, we got to keep Keystone from happening. Um, and never let it out of the ground. Well, five minutes, le five years later, it's out of the ground. It's moving. It's moving by train. Um, so the real question now is what's the safest way to move it, what's the cheapest way to move it, and what is the least environmentally damaging way to move it? Um, I'm not speaking for my company here, by the way, but I mean, the answer is a pipeline. It's, it's, it's really that simple. And, and to me, uh, I mean, m my boss's boss, Mr. Buffett, by the way, although owning uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, which is moving a lot of that oil by train, has also said, he said for years, Keystone should be approved. Um, so he's, he's for all of the above in terms of moving it. But, but Keystone, to me, has really begun to represent kind of the sad reality of, of modern political discourse, which is, I really don't care what you have to tell me. I'm not listening to you. I really don't care. Um, uh, I mean, the debate really just moved so far from reality. The proponents kept saying, 42,000 jobs, 42,000 jobs. Keystone is going to bring 42,000 jobs. That's what the State Department says in its report. And it does talk about a lot of construction jobs. And there are going to be 35 permanent jobs. And then on the other side, the opponents. I mean, you had a pretty well-respected NASA scientist, James Hansen, saying Build, building Keystone will be game over for climate change. I mean, give me a break. I mean, you're talking about oil that is 13% more greenhouse gas concentrated than, than the less dense oil, and it's one pipeline. So, I mean, look, the oil's coming out. It's being transported one way or the other. The State Department report said the net impact on climate change would not be significant. Um, the Senate spent all January debating this. It elevated this. It really, the politics of symbolism came over. One of my one of my students at Georgetown said that she was just sick and tired of Keystone because she works on Capitol Hill and her inbox is just filled with these Keystone emails. She said, I just, I just wish they would get over it one way or the other. Uh, and I really, I mean, it should have been treated, if you ask me, like a routine application, uh, you know, for an infrastructure project, but it's really been blown way out of proportion. Um, last couple of minutes, let me come back to this, in this, this EPA rule because that is what the EP, that, that's really affecting the electricity industry. This is a rule under, it's called 111D. I, I'll try not to get too wonkish here, but this is under the Clean Air Act. And it basically calls nationwide for a 30% cut in greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants 
by 2030 based on 2005 levels. Now, luckily, the industry has already cut about 15 percent of greenhouse gas emissions since 2005, but still another 15 percent. The regulation regulates all 50 states. It doesn't regulate individual power plants. It doesn't indiv regulate individual utilities. It's state by state, um, based on what each state can accomplish. And it's kind of bizarre. Kentucky is required to reduce its emissions, and this is pounds per megawatt hour, by 11 percent from, what are the numbers, from 17, almost 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour to 1,700 pounds. Idaho? Idaho is only at 858 pounds per megawatt hour. You guys got to get down to 228. North Dakota's got to get down to 1,700. So every state is different. And North Dakota is being asked to reduce its emissions 11 percent. Idaho's got to reduce its emissions 73 percent. Um, it's kind of a bizarre rule. EPA gave, gave the states four building blocks. More efficiency on your coal plants, increase the utilization of your gas plants over your coal plants. Number three, more renewables. Number four, energy efficiency. Well, newsflash, Idaho doesn't rely on coal, so you can't increase the efficiency of your coal plants because you don't have any, so that's one. You can't use more natural gas over existing coal because you don't have any coal plants, so Idaho's being asked to deploy a whole lot of new renewables. It's really kind of crazy. One last point on regionalism. Um, this is also kind of wonkish, but Amy, if you haven't given me the hook yet for questions, let me just cover this very briefly. Um, we own a utility in the Midwest called Mid-American Energy. That, we started building wind about 10 years ago. Next year, that utility, we will sell 50% of our sales from wind. How can we do it? We dispatch that wind, we sell it into a huge grid, and I didn't bring any slides with me, but think Louisiana up to Montana, over to the Dakotas, and up into Manitoba. Fifteen states. Think of the entire swath of the central part of our country. That's the grid, or balancing authority, that we sell it into. Go west of the Rockies, there are 38 separate grids that have to take care of supply and demand every second to keep the lights on, that have to have reserve requirements for when it gets incredibly cold or incredibly warm. The West is completely balkanized. So we think of the West with these great renewable resources and great solar in the Southwest and California the leader, but they're completely balkanized in their grid. Um, one thing that's happening regionally, our company, which also owns a utility called Pacific Corp, and we're here as Rocky Mountain Power in Idaho and Wyoming and Utah, and we're Pacific Power in parts of Washington, Oregon, and California. Not big parts, but we're there. We're biggest in Utah. Um, we entered into agreement with the California, the main grid operator in California. That doesn't include Los Angeles or Sacramento, but it's about 70% it's about of the transmission in California. We entered into an agreement with them that just went live a couple of months ago called Energy Imbalance Market. Think of it as match.com for electrons is the easiest way to describe it. We, they now can tap into our system on a five minute ahead automated market. We can tap into theirs. So if you're a utility, what are your goals? Your goals are to provide electricity for your customers that's affordable, that's reliable, and arguably sustainable. I mean, you want to, we are moving towards a decarbonized uh, electricity sector. We have seen, we went live only on November 1, but, but California is now tapping into Idaho, into our, our resources that we have in Idaho and Wyoming, um, Oregon, and our company, when we're seeing with so much renewables in California, there's actually been over-generation of solar. There is now, and there's going to be even more, so there's a need almost to curtail some of this renewable energy that's coming online in California. We can help with that by bidding at pretty low prices to take some of that electricity. So you're beginning to see regionalism. In fact, I was in Sacramento just two days ago in the governor's office, and my message was, you know, California, you're a great leader, but you know, leading doesn't necessarily mean going first. Leading means making sure folks follow you. So if you really want to, to move forward into this new economy, you need to work with the region. Uh, and that's, that's, this, that's really the whole West, and I really think we're going to see more of that. Um, 
you know, I could talk more. I could talk about 2016, but I said four years ago it was going to be Clinton Bush. Um, you know, we had a Clinton Bush race. That's kind of the easiest. It is interesting to see politically where we're going, but you know, historically, the the Democrats have these big food fights, and you know, people like Jimmy Carter come out of nowhere, um, and Bill Clinton come out of nowhere, and the Republicans kind of coronate the loser from the last one. Uh, you know, Reagan went up against Jerry Ford and lost. Bob Dole went up, you know, and, 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 and McCain was, you know, was the loser, so he gets it in 2008. It's the exact reverse this year. It's really kind of amazing. I mean, Hillary's being coronated, and there's this food fight among the Republicans. Um, but I could talk about that too, but Amy, um, I see you moving, so let me stop there and see what kind of questions we have before I get into more trouble. Thank you. I could listen to your jokes all day long. Those are great. Um, but let's talk about public, public involvement. You, you mentioned it a little bit as it related to Keystone. Um, we'll bring it to our backyard. Um, involve, uh, public involvement, whether it's a, a, a windmill going up in your backyard, or whether it's a new dam, or whether it's a new energy plant. Um, what are the best, what's the best way to get the public involved? Are there any new or innovative approaches to having the public um, be more involved or have real input to the process? Single best thing, if you have opinions on any of these, whether it's a transmission line that may be going up in your backyard or a dam that you want built or a dam you want taken out um, or a power plant you want to see or a type of energy you don't want to see, uh, your state public utility commission. Um, those are the ones, they do the permitting. Um, now, an interstate transmission line, yes, there's federal permitting, and of course, you all know of the role of, and certainly out in Idaho here with BLM and federal agencies, but, but for anything being cited on private land, um, the state public utility commission is the one to grant the permit, um, and you, you all should be involved. I mean, these issues are, highly political. My own company, we're in the business of building power plants. We're taking out, we're proposing to take out four dams along the Klamath River in Northern California. And I can tell you, we got, I mean, again, all of this has turned incredibly political. We've got, um, we've got mayors and county supervisors where those dams are coming out uh, who are, you know, incredibly opposed because of what that's going to do to, to, to property values around those dams. And then we've got Indian tribes, we've got environmentalists, we've got irrigators, um, and we've got finally ourselves to come on board to say, you know, it'll be cheaper to take those dams out than to relicense them because that's going to be twice as expensive. So what do you do as a utility? What's in the best cost of your customers? That's what a utility should be thinking about. I think most utilities in this country, look, we're still monopolies, and we have to recognize that customers come first. And the best way for customers to talk to us is go through public utility commissions or contact utilities directly. But um, we've got basic core principles, and I will tell you, core principle number one is customer service. I mean, environmental respect, operational integrity, um, and, and regulatory integrity, and, and, and employee safety, and financial strength, but everything starts with customer service. Okay, thank you. Um, this region has often be re been referred to as the um, Middle East of North America, given the fact that we are surrounded by energy-rich states, and that also includes to the north of us in Canada with Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, we also have low population centers, so our policy influence is not as high as it should be. So can you speak a little bit on what can we do collectively in this region, including maybe north of us in Canada, to help influence national or international energy policy? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I made 21 trips to Canada last year because we were acquiring a transmission company in Alberta. And I can, I can tell you some statistics off the top of my head. Um, Canada is bigger than the continental United States. It's got a population that is smaller than California's. Um, uh, it is a resource-rich and population-small country. Um, Idaho and parts of the, you know, this, the parts of the West, uh, also vast expanses of land. And when you take California away and, and other urban centers, uh, you're absolutely right. One, 
You know, one saving grace in our country is um, the founding fathers and their wisdom set up a U.S. Senate. Um, I mean, I'd, I would tell you that, that, that the coal industry would be even weaker than it is today, and it's obviously under attack. I mean, someone talked about the war on coal and saying there's a war on coal, and I would argue that really what's going on right now is negotiating the surrender terms. Um, but, but, you know, when you look at you look at our Senate structure and you look at states, small states like Wyoming, like West Virginia and others that do get two senators and Iowa, you've got a delegation of four in the US Congress. Um, um, uh, that is one saving grace in terms of policy. Um, the other issue that you've got to deal with in the West is the tremendous influence of the federal government. And I'll tell you, when I saw a sign driving in Alberta that said, more Alberta, less Ottawa, <laughs> I, thought of the, I, I, I thought of attitudes in the Western US. I mean, you know, Ottawa's way back there east and Washington's way back there east. And there, I mean, there are folks in Oregon and Washington who don't want to hear about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, so, I mean, you know, part of the answer is you, 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 and, and, and you're, you've got a pretty, well, you've got one congressman, I'll leave out, but you've got, you've got, you've got three pretty, you've got a very good, strong congressional delegation. Um, you've got two terrific senators, um, and they do a very good job, whether it's fighting for uh, INL uh, for, or for the rest of the state, and that's the way policy plays out. I would add, when you think about policy, let me be honest, we don't have energy policy in this country. We got tax policy and we've got environmental policy. And I mean, those were my comments earlier. That dictates energy policy. This ain't France. I mean, God bless France. I mean, that, maybe that's the benefit of a, of a oligarch, well, a, 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 of a democracy, but, but, but a, a different form of democracy when France in the late 50s and early 60s said, we don't have the resources, we're going nuclear. So 80% of France's electricity is nuclear. We can't do that as a country. We've got hydro in the Northwest. We've got, of our 100 nuclear reactors, you could tell me, Amy, I'm guessing that almost 80 of 100 are east of the Mississippi, probably, maybe more. Um, you've got coal in the Midwest. You've got natural gas in New England. We don't have that energy policy. So don't worry about being underrepresented in the policy debate. It ain't much of a debate, sometimes. We, this, we, I, this is going to be rebroadcast. Let me let me retract that. We have we have a vibrant debate going on in the society and a vibrant Senate and House that talk about important issues of energy law. <laughs> wow, we did get a lot of questions about energy policy, and we have two years left of this administration. Um, what are your predictions as to whether we'll have any debate or any discussion, and there there will be a national energy policy passed? Is it even necessary? Um, yeah, some things are definitely necessary. I think that um, when, when you look at the, I mean, let, let's take the US Senate. You've got a, a chairman of an Energy and Natural Resources Committee called Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. This is an intelligent, reasonable woman. I mean, she's gotten a little emotional on issues directly affecting Alaska in the last couple of months. But in general, you've got an incredibly bright, engaged senator who reaches across the aisle who, when my office gets calls from Republicans and Democrats alike saying, we need some ideas, we want to forge a bill, that's a good sign. We have not had a major energy bill in this country since 2005. And that was, I mean, kind of the last time we really debated energy. That was the Energy Policy Act of 2005. 18 separate titles. Um, there was a House-Senate conference. They filled a room. It was a public debate. And, you know, there were three things that a young senator named Barack Obama didn't like, and there were about three things that he did like. I lobbied him directly. And um, uh, there was actually some horse trading going on. And it was, I mean, what is politics? Politics is the art of compromise. So if you're coming to Washington and saying, you know, no compromise, you're coming to the wrong town because that's not the way it works. I do think that someone like Lisa Murkowski wants to put together a modest energy package. There is room on streamlining. There is room. We've got to begin to address the nuclear waste issue. Um, there are issues affecting uh, transmission siting. Uh, there are lots of small areas where there should be some energy progress on energy policy. And my guess is there will be. 
The question will be, in terms of the second part of your question with Obama, if you're going to try to completely take apart this 111D rule, much like, you know, if you want to tweak Obamacare, that might help. If you want to repeal it, like the House has done 56 times, it ain't going to happen. I mean, don't waste the paper. So the challenge will be to get a reasonable middle together that can look at areas of energy policy that are that, that, that need work that stay away from the extremes that actually could get signed by the president. And my own prediction, despite the flip in the Senate from Democrat to Republican, I think that it can happen. And the main reason, one main reason it ha it's going, I, I think it will happen is in 2016, the Republicans are going to have to defend, I forget what the numbers are, but of the 32 Senate seats up, they've got to defend 24, and a lot of those are vulnerable. The Republicans want to show they can govern in the next two years, A, so they can keep the Senate, B, so they can make a credible claim to, to retake the White House. I mean, don't forget, five of the last six elections, the popular vote has gone for the Democrats. I mean, that's counting Al Gore as the winner of the popular vote, obviously not the president. But those are, those are the challenges the Republicans are facing, and this is their chance to show they can govern. So, and I'm, by the way, I'm a lone voice there. My, my other bottom-feeding, scum-sucking lobbyist friends in Washington all say, it ain't going to happen, you're kidding yourself. I think there is real hope for an, a decent energy bill by 2016. Great, thanks. We hope you're right. Um, on nuclear, since you have quite a nuclear crowd here in this audience today, um, you mentioned Yucca Mountain. What are your predictions in terms of uh, some movement in terms of how, how we're going to be handling our nuclear waste? Uh, that's a tough one because, I mean, you had, you, you had a Blue Ribbon Commission come out with a report a couple of years ago really saying, you know, this top-down, well, let me, let me back up. 30 years ago, Congress passed legislation that said there are three places we're going to look we're going to bury waste. One is Washington State, one is Texas, one is Yucca Mountain. Well, we had a Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, who ruled out Texas. We had Washington ruled out for political reasons, so the only thing that was left was Yucca, and then came Harry Reid. Um, I don't think you're going to get nuclear storage by forcing it down anyone's throat. So yes, the Yucca process will reopen. Will Yucca actually work uh, for spent nuclear waste? I, I just don't. I just don't know. The the Blue Ribbon Commission said the better approach would be a consensus-based approach, looking for communities that are actually willing to host nuclear waste. Now, a number of Indian tribes have come forward. Uh, there are there are other places around the world to put nuclear waste. Uh, the Canadians are. Look, we're not the only nation dealing with this problem. Yes, the French reprocess and the Germans have found a partial solution, but uh, other nuclear countries are, are, are facing the same kinds of problems we are. I, I just don't know if this top-down yucca approach is, is, is going to be the right solution. I, I think the better way to go would be probably to reopen the process so it's not going to happen any time in two years, but to look for more of a consensus-based approach of, of communities that would be willing to host nuclear waste as opposed to shoving it down the throat of an individual state or locality. Continuing on the nuclear theme, a couple questions came in uh, as to whether the public considers nuclear as a renewable or a clean energy. I get into this debate I just had it in California on Wednesday. You know, California amended its constitution. Uh, California's got one nuclear plant left. The San Onofre shut down. Diablo Canyon, uh, yeah, Diablo Canyon is, is, is still operating um, uh, and is going to be up for relicensing. The Calif California, in one of its ballot issues, amended it con its constitution to say there will be no nuclear power plants built in California until the waste problem is solved. Um, in the governor's office, in my, I had a two-hour meeting on Wednesday, and nuclear came up once, and people just sort of laughed. Um, and I said what I've said before, uh, if, if you really care, about, if you really think climate change is a threat to our planet, and if you really want to get rid of all the fossil fuel plants in this country and around the world, you can't 
replace that without addressing, with, with, without nuclear power. You just can't do it. My own company, we are, we are a huge producer of wind and solar. As I told you, we started as geothermal. We are about 25% carbon free. We have a tiny partial ownership of one nuclear plant only, so we're not in that business. But you really can't have a serious debate about climate change worldwide unless you want to talk about nuclear. Even today, it is two-thirds of our carbon-free resource. So I think that nuclear has to stay on the table as an option. The biggest challenge now happens to be cost. Um, and right now, there's no utility. I mean, there are so there are four or five being built, South Carolina, Georgia, TVA just just um, uh, commissioned a new one, but but it's really not much. I mean, the, the, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just announced yesterday, the day before, that they're probably going to lower staff uh, over time because this, I mean, the nuclear renaissance that we read about years ago is threatening to take as long as Italy's to get off the ground. Um, and that's not going to be good for people in this room who average 28 years old. Um, um, it's got to move faster. I don't see utilities buying 1,000 and 1,500 megawatt nuclear reactors. To me, the answer is small modular reactors. I think that's the wave of the future as it happens. My own, con by the way, our, our company, we actually looked in Idaho. This was about seven or eight years ago. I'm not, I'm not speaking out of school. Looked at nuclear. And when we looked at the embedded cost of our energy here in the Northwest, especially with so much hydro, it just didn't make sense economically. We then looked at two sites in Iowa, east and west, and that was thinking SMR, small modular reactors, where we didn't go forward, but we are still intrigued by, by, by small modular reactors. And I think from a cost, from a, a timing and permitting point of view, that could well be the answer. Great, thank you. Oh, uh, let me just add one other thing. We do have, we've, we've got a regulatory headache in this country. I mean, I, the, you guys know better than I. The AP1000, the, the license went in in 1985 and was approved in 2006. I, th I think those numbers are correct. I mean, you're a utility. You can't, you can't, ha you can't keep capital up in the air for that period of time. Another uh, big energy source in Idaho or interest is hydro, and you mentioned it a little bit in your talk. Can you speak a little bit? Is that all? Is hydro considered a renewable energy? And uh, what's the future of hydro? By the way, I didn't fully answer your earlier question. In California, again, as the leader, I mean, their first renewable energy piece of legislation defined renewable energy and Hydro is in, I believe, at under 20 megawatts. It could be 30. I think it's under 20. Somebody may. Okay. I mean, so hydro can be seen as a renewable in California. Large hydro is not. Now, the, the justification is that, that, you know, Hoover Dam type dams don't need the same kind of incentives that a, that a small wind farm or a small dam needs. Um, Nuclear is not counted as renewable energy under most state renewable portfolio mandates, which if renewable means carbon free, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There have been federal bills introduced that would include nuclear and, and, and give full credit to hydro um, as renewables, but generally at the state level, it's generally wind, solar, geothermal biomass that, that most states consider or don't consider legislate as renewable. So despite the fact that hydro and nuclear are carbon free, most states with these RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard Mandates, don't include either. Um, the future, um, you know, there's not a lot of room for big hydro in this country, uh, but, but I mean, again, incrementally, yes, uh, that's, that's been a great source. I mean, drought aside, um, and, and, and the beauty of hydro, hydro can work like just like a natural gas plant. It can beautifully supplement the variability of wind and solar um, uh, as well. I mean, that's why pumped storage is so wonderful. I mean, just like you can turn a gas stove on and off, you can, you can get water through a dam as quickly as you need to, and you can turn that on and off without causing huge damage. You can't obviously do that to a nuclear plant or, or a coal plant. Okay, moving on to a question, a couple questions we had on, on fracking. Is fracking a concern, uh, environmental concern? Where are we going with it regulatorily? Um, is it worth it? 
Well, the technology has been around for decades. Um, uh, the, the, so w we know the technology is there. The, the problem in the industry is when you get a bad apple and you get a company that does not do fracking correctly. I mean, the, f the, 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 nuclear, the, the, the natural gas industry, when they get their first three-mile island with fracking, it's going to be a big problem. Um, and, and, and the bigger problem to me with fracking is what happens on the surface. I mean, tremendous disturbances on the surface, the need to cap those wells very carefully at the top. Once you're down 1,500 feet or five, and you're below the aquifer, it, it, it's, not, it's not a problem for the environment. But again, it is seen that way. I mean, the Sierra Club, uh, uh, which, 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 which had its huge attack on coal and has relentlessly been attacking coal, is now relentlessly attacking natural gas. And, um, you know, you have states like New York putting a moratorium on fracking. Oddly enough, not California, where Governor Brown has said we need to see an answer. And then you have this very interesting debate, which is can an indi could the town of Idaho Falls could, could the mayor sign a, a legislation from the city council saying no fracking in Idaho Falls if the state legislature passed a bill that said fracking is allowed in Idaho? Um, that has just come up um, in, I forget what state, and maybe it's Ohio, I forget one, but anyway, the Supreme Court of one of the states has said once the state sets that policy, individual municipalities cannot. You know, one thing I've always loved about Berkeley and uh, actually Silver Spring, Maryland, is their nuclear-free zones. You know, you can't, you can't detonate a nuclear weapon in, in Berkeley. Um, and it, it's against the law. Um, you know, there's sort of a limit as to what individual uh, municipalities can do here. Um, but fracking, I mean, the industry, what, the industry is doing some good self-regulation. Wyoming was the first state. Uh, Governor Friedenthal said, look, this, fracking is important. Um, we need to post online what the chemicals are that are used. Uh, I think that is important for the industry, but that, that self-regulation is absolutely critical if fracking is going to succeed. And again, talking about energy independence, I mean, it's hard to believe that, and, and that's why I said earlier, if you remember anything, it's, it's, it's fracking is, is the biggest single change. We are today, we the United States, are the largest producers of natural gas of any country in the world. And thanks to the horizontal drilling and fracking, by the end of this year, we will be producing more oil than any country in the world. That's more than Saudi Arabia. That's more than Venezuela. We do more natural gas than Russia. Um, that, I mean, that has led, uh, I, I, I forget, I mean, again, again, all these trade associations inflate their jobs and all of that, but I mean, you look at the American Petroleum Institute website and, and, and or even look at the Commerce Department, several hundred thousand new jobs have been created because of fracking. And then when you look at that lower cost, we're bringing fertilizer plants, we're bringing chemical plants back to the United States. I mean, heck, back in 2005, Alan Greenspan testified before Congress five times on the critical need to build LNG, liquefied natural gas, plants to import liquefied natural gas into this country because we needed more. Most of those plants are applying for licenses today to export American liquefied natural gas. That is how much the industry has changed in one decade. Economically, you would say this is a stable industry, oh, energy oh, oh, oh. industry. Uh, you know, in the course of two years, I went to two different conferences, and at the first one, a guy said, the price of natural gas will not go below five cents in my lifetime. And at the second one, the guy, different guy, said the price of natural gas will not go above five cents in my lifetime. Now, they were each about, you know, your age. Um, 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 no, they were, but, but, but it's amazing to see. The biggest, one of the biggest problems, I mentioned earlier that we're 50% wind in Iowa. We use the renewable energy as a hedge against the fossil fuel prices because we know what the cost of a solar plant or a wind plant is, and we know what the cost of the fuel is. It's that much. It's nothing. In the space of three years, the price of natural gas, which is measured in terms of dollars per million BTU, varied from just above 2 to just below 14 in the United States. Now, imagine 
filling up your car and in the in the in the course of two or three course of two or three years <coughs> sorry in the course of two or three years seeing the price per gallon go from two to fourteen is a very emotional issue <laughs> sorry fighting fighting a bad um, cold um, that volatility is crazy the energy information agency which is never wrong puts out price predictions and you look now at natural gas and it's absolutely flat uh, at no more than four dollars into the indefinite future it's amazing i mean as of yesterday natural gas was at 280 um, which is why nuclear is getting killed uh, which is why it's hard so so the volatility in pricing of natural gas is tricky quite frankly if this epa rule leads and it is a natural gas rule it is a it is a rule that is going to result in the closure of tens of thousands of megawatts of coal plants and they're going to be replaced by tens of thousands of megawatts of natural gas plants. Well, there are other uses of natural gas. It's manufacturing, it's a feedstock, it's for hospitals. Half the homes in the U.S. use natural gas. Half the homes in the U.S. don't use coal. So if you're running a coal plant, I mean, you're just worried about the railroad getting your coal, but you're not worried about the hospital or the manufacturer or the homes. You're not competing with them. So if there's a rush to natural gas, that prediction from the Energy Administration, like all of its previous predictions, will be dead wrong. Um, and uh, we've just got to watch out for that. Generally, as a country, an all-eggs-in-one-basket approach doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think part of the strength of this country, from an energy point of view, has been our diversification. Nuclear at 20, natural gas. I mean, it used to be gas at about, coal at about 50, nuclear 20 gas 20 and then kind of renewables maybe 10. That's changed somewhat obviously with coal down, but it's still an amazingly diversified uh, fuel sources that we have in this country. And I think that's a big danger with, with, with every utility running to natural gas. Okay, I have one more question. It's very, a very short answer would be great. Um, <laughs> just because we're running out of time. Um, what would be the single most important technology breakthrough that could help the energy industry? Energy storage. Thank you very much. Um, no, uh, no, the the um, uh, energy storage. Really, uh, whether whether it's I mean, a lot of work is going on you know in this town on energy storage. Um, if if we can successfully uh, uh, improve not just batteries but look at other ways to store energy. And, and be able to use the vast amounts of free wind and solar that we have and be able to integrate it into the grid. That's great because look, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, those resources don't create electricity. If you could store that electricity, it would work. So that's my short answer. Thank you, Amy. <laughs>